This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to N. Tolliver and Pebro, who both just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 460 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing Ursula K. Le Guin's classic 1974 novel, The Dispossessed, an ambiguous utopia. The Dispossessed, which won the Hugo, Nebula, and Locus Awards, is part of Le Guin's Hainish cycle, which also includes Rokinon's World, The Word for World is Forest, and The Left Hand of Darkness. And this will include spoilers for everything in the book, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Anthony Ha, making his 25th appearance on the show. He covers media, advertising, and pop culture for TechCrunch. And he's also the host of the film and TV podcast, Original Content. A chapbook of his short stories called Love Songs for Monsters was published by Youth in Decline in 2014. And his short story, Late Train, appeared in the February 2019 issue of Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet. So Anthony, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. The next up, we've got Matthew Kressel making his 18th appearance on the show. He's the author of the novel King of Shards, and his short story, The Last Novelist, or A Dead Lizard in the Yard, was nominated for the Nebula Award and was a finalist for the Yuji Foster Memorial Award. His new novel, Queen of Static, is available now on his Patreon page over at patreon.com slash Matt Kressel. So Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, good to be back. And also joining us today is Lisa Yazik, making her seventh appearance on the show. She's Regents Professor of Science Fiction Studies at Georgia Tech and author of the nonfiction books Galactic Suburbia, Sisters of Tomorrow, and The Future is Female. She also appears in the AMC miniseries James Cameron's Story of Science Fiction. So, Lisa, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be back. Okay, so let's start off with Anthony and to have you tell us about your history reading The Dispossessed. I first read The Dispossessed in, I believe, my freshman year in college, not because it was assigned, but probably because there was something else I was supposed to be reading, and I decided (laughs) to read The Dispossessed instead. And um, I think that was probably the perfect age to read it for the first time, because I would be hard-pressed to think of another novel that made as strong an impression on me. Like I was insufferable about it. I put quotes (laughs) in my email signatures and... um, you know, was identified as an anarchist for several years after that. And uh, I mean, I, it it was, you know, at the time I, I identified, I called it my favorite novel. It probably still is, or certainly one of my favorite novels. Um, I actually haven't reread it maybe as much as some other books that I love, but I think this is maybe my fourth time rereading it. And I feel like every time I do, I get something new out of it. And as much as I, you know, I think as I've gotten older, I can see more of its faults. Um, it, it it still completely impresses and immerses me and, and you know, not just as a, as a work of art, but as a book that I think asks political questions that at least, especially when I was younger, I really hadn't thought about. So did you have any anarchist leanings at all before reading the book? Like, did you go full anarchist from this one book or... I think there were a few different things in the mix that, you know, um, this was kind of the the late 90s, early aughts when I think that was a strong streak in kind of American protest movements. Um, I was also reading the Invisibles graphic novels by Grant Morrison, which are also very influenced by anarchism and particularly by Peter Kropotkin, or I don't know if I'd say influence, but Kropotkin at least is a sort of touchstone of it. And um I think all of those things together with a general sort of inclination towards uh, left-leaning political philosophies pushed me in in that direction. But certainly, I think The Dispossessed was probably the deciding factor. Was this your first Le Guin book, or had you read other books by her prior to this? I had definitely read The Left Hand of Darkness, and I liked it, but it certainly did not have the 
kind of emotional resonance with me that that the dispossessed did. And I think I probably read A Wizard of Earthsea around the same time, which I also love and consider one of my favorite novels. Um, but I don't remember which one I read first. All right, so how about Matt? What's your history with The Dispossessed? Uh, I think I first encountered it, uh, read it probably about 20 years ago or so, maybe 2002, 2003. And, uh, you know, I had read, probably read Left Hand of Darkness a little bit before that and um, read had read A Lathe of Heaven, you know, at some point in college. So I wasn't super familiar with a lot of um, Le Guin's science fiction. And then like after reading Dispossessed, I was like, I was just blown away. And I, I think what really struck me was that it was just such a, like an intellectual book, like it, it's philosophical. And it was so different from a lot of the science fiction I had read before that, that it just made me want to read more of Le Guin's work. And when I discovered that, you know, there were a whole series of books in this world um, that it just kind of led me on this chain. And I, and I started, I started reading like a lot of her books for, for a while. And just um, it's interesting because, you know, my memory of reading the book then, and then reading it again now, like the things that I took from it 20 years ago were very different that I take from it now, you know, as a person that's, you know, experienced a lot in those two decades, I, I see things a lot differently. And, and, and like, I think like the first time through, I, I focused a lot on um, like the science of it. Like I was really excited that Shevik was a scientist who's, you know, coming up with this great theory, like the next Einstein. And that was like the big thing in my head. And this time through, I was like much more aware of the, like the po politics and the, and the like socio-political tension between these colonies and and like the idea of like you know the flawed utopia and all these ideas were in my head and they were definitely there the first time through but i, I think this time um really kind of hit me harder i guess did you, so did you ever become an anarchist or start adding <laughs> quotes from the book to your email signatures or anything crazy like that i i did not i have i actually i i i almost feel like this book is kind of a critique of anarchism in a way. I mean, I, we could get to that as we, we talk about it, but I, I feel as if like it points out some of its flaws. I mean, clearly it also points out like the flaws of like a, a, a capitalist system as well. And, and um, you know, like, um, but both systems I think have their flaws. And, and, and my opinion is, I think you need elements of both, but uh, no, I didn't, I did not become an anarchist <laughs> after reading the book. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like this book points out a lot of flaws of lots of different political theories and people and everything. Uh, a lot of flaws going on in this book. Um, it's interesting because, you know, I uh, I didn't really, I came to Le Guin kind of late, or I guess I'm still coming to Le Guin kind of late. You know, um, she was one of the authors that my teachers liked when I was a kid. And I had just sort of this independent streak where I was like, I don't want to read anything my teachers are recommending. So, um, so I didn't read any of Le Guin until, um, until I was at Clarion in 1999 and they recommended a book for each person to read, you know, sort of a personalized recommendation. And since I liked Philip K. Dick, um, uh, Karen Joy Fowler recommended The Way of Heaven to me. So I read that and I was like, oh, this is actually really good. And then a few years later or within the next couple of years, I read A Wizard of Earthsea and I've read some of the short stories. I mean, obviously like, um, the ones to walk away from Omelas, but, um, I'd never read, uh, I've never read um, The Dispossessed or Left Hand of Darkness. And so I'm doing this project to kind of, you know, read some of the classic novels that uh, I, I haven't, that I'm sort of embarrassed to admit that I've never read. So this is step one of that. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I guess I'll, I'll say, I'll say a bit more about that in a little bit. But so Lisa, what is your um, uh, history of reading The Dispossessed? It's so interesting to to listen to all of you. I've actually read it three times now over the, the course of my life and um, in always very different circumstances. And like Matthew, I feel like at every point in time, I've gotten something very different out of it. It definitely, I think that this is the brilliance of Le Guin is that uh, she writes in this complex way that speaks to you at so many different points in your life. And if I remember, we all, many of us watched the Le Guin documentary in the last few days and someone talks about that in the documentary as well. And so first of all, 
Yes, absolutely. Um, but here, it's interesting. I, I guess my arc through it is a little different than either Anthony or, or Matthews. Um, so the first time I encountered it was as a, a teen and at the young end of my teen years, maybe 12 or 13 at the oldest. My parents were both science fiction readers and big fans of the new wave. And so I was, I read Le Guin about the same time I was reading Joanna Russ and Sam Delaney. And honestly, to me as a 12 year old, 13 year old, she was really boring compared to Delaney and Russ. I was so much more <laughs> excited by the worlds they built. And, you know, and, and not, I didn't, I mean, I, I, I liked it. Like I kind of, I got like the bigness of it. That was pretty cool. The critique of capitalism spoke to me even at that age for sure. But like, I don't know, JL with her like, you know, switchblade nails and her hatred of both men and women. And it just spoke to me more. And, you know, Sam Delaney's like, you know, neurotic, frustrated narrators who are always like biting their nails or falling in love with people who bite their nails. Just, like, <laughs> the humanity of it. And yet, uh, you know, it's how they all want to be Flash Gordon, but then they all turn out to be something other than Flash Gordon, which is ultimately better. And like, I don't know, it just, so she didn't speak to me that much then, but you know, um, I was certainly glad I had read her. It was, you know, it's a name you can throw down when you're talking to other science fiction people. And it triangulated nicely with reading, you know, her and Russ and Delaney. And then I did not read any Le Guin at all for, oh gosh, at least 15, maybe 20 years until I was in graduate school in the 1990s. And I was working at WISCON, uh, the oldest and largest feminist science fiction convention in the world. And I ended up having breakfast with Le Guin and Judith Merrill. And by the way, best breakfast of my entire life. <laughs> I, I, nothing will ever be better than that day. Um, and that was a really interesting moment. And uh, it made me want to go back and look at Le Guin's work again, of course. And you may remember, or, or you may not, like she was super hot again in the 90s. Like there really was a book every year. Uh, again, someone had mentioned that in the documentary. It's really true. And she was everywhere. And it was cool rereading the book then. Um, and I still didn't really like it, though, is the funny part. Um, I felt at that point I had a greater appreciation for like her as a literary force. But I still just didn't love the politics. I was really bored. I was just like, I don't know. This is about white guys and their problems. And just these are not problems that really speak to me as uh, a, a young woman on the edge of the 21st century. And it just, you know, it was cool. I was glad I reread it, but it felt like history at that point. Um, and then we reread it now. And here that is almost 20 years later. And I liked it a lot better this time. I'm still actually kind of bored by how it's about Shevik. No offense to anyone who really likes Shevik, <laughs> but like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Shevik drives me nuts. And I kind of think that's on purpose. So I, I don't think that that's entirely a problem, but like her writing is so cool, you know, and it's really beautiful. And I love that final image of how there will always have to be another Anaris, you know, I, oh, that's just smart. So smart. And, uh, so yeah, this time, thank you. I'm glad to come back to it and get more layers out of it this time. So I think every time I've hit it, like my aesthetic appreciation for it goes up narratively. I don't know, man. It's just never gonna, I don't know. I don't know if it'll yeah, ever I, hail me. I mean, I want to jump off something you said, like like as a as a you know young woman reading that. I mean, one of the things that struck me this time, and I'm, I don't remember like how exactly I felt the first time because it was about 20 years ago, but this is the second time through. And I was like, I wondered like, why didn't Le Guin make Shevik a woman, right? Because it seemed it seemed like an obvious thing to, to for me to like not only have you know a, a person from another culture come come to the this society, but a woman as well. Because the scientists in that culture seem very dismissive of of women as scientists. And I thought you know this was a, this was a an opportunity for for Le Guin to to make a, a point there. And and I was trying to wonder like was this because she didn't think that people would want to read a, or, or people would want to read a story about a a woman scientist or wouldn't believe it or the publishers wouldn't believe it. But then I'm like, no, Le Guin always took risks. So I, I don't know if anyone knows more about this than I do. Like, because it just seemed o obvious to me. Yeah, yeah. Please. Oh, uh, sorry. Does someone else want to go? Oh, I, I was just going to say, uh, I don't know if, Matt, if you watched the documentary, I think. I did, yeah. Oh, you, okay. Well, because there was that line in the documentary yeah. when, when they're, t I mean, they were talking about um, the fourth Earthsea book, mm -hmm. but she says that she kind of had this whole complex about writing powerful women. And it was something that, you know, it was after the period that she wrote this book that it, that it seems like that she kind of, yeah, you know, moved into that. 
Yeah, and she also said that like when she when she finishes a book, um, that's not all she has to say on it, right? That that she it was a discussion or a, like a thought process, but you get to the end of the book doesn't mean it's the end of the discussion. So I think one thing that's really interesting, right, is there's a couple ways you could read it. One is like as she said herself, it just wasn't in her. Uh, head or her soul in the 1960s to write a female protagonist. She just wasn't there yet. And like props to her for just saying, you know what, people change over time. Because I think that that's really smart and true. And I totally get that. Um, But there's also this time through, one thing that really intrigued me about the book, and I can't tell if this was like a really brilliant decision or like part of her battle about what to do with gender is like, yeah, it's about Shevik. And you know, that's cool. And like I said, I still think it's about guys and all that. And that's fine. That's not a problem. I think there's a lot of people who will really, um, you know, follow along with this either for whatever reasons. But all of Shevik's uh, mentors are women, right? Mm-hmm. And that's part of the problem mm-hmm. when he goes back to Euros is he's like, what is wrong with you people? Like, because he's like, oh, all my mentors were women. And, you know, he has a very different relationship. And so that's cool. Like, what would it be like to be a man who grows up in a culture where women as well as men are likely to be your mentors? And I think that that's a really smart thing she's doing. Mm-hmm. So, right, that's cool. Before we get too far into this, I do want to just set up what the book's about for people who haven't read it or, um, you know, maybe haven't read it in a long time. Um, and it's a pretty complicated there's a lot of world building go on, going on here, so people can, um, you know, feel free to throw things in if I'm missing anything. But so basically, we're it seems several hundred years in the future, and Earth had been kind of ruined by environmental problems and totalitarian government and everything until an alien species called the Hanish, which were a much older, wiser civilization, came and kind of rescued humanity from itself. Well, they're all actually human, though, the Hanish, I should put in there. Okay, so explain that. I've only read this. Is that explained in this book, or do you have to read the other I, books? Uh, there's the, um, I always forget if they're called the Ecumen or the Hanish, but the, but the species, um, like, they seeded multiple worlds, and then for whatever reason, yeah. they lost contact with each other, and then yeah. the Hainish reestablished contact. So they're actually all that, the human species. They're or all like, Hainish. You know, di- yeah, divergent. They're all, they're all, yeah. yeah, I think they're all divergent Hainish, and the Ecumen is the name of the uh, federation they set up. Right, okay. right, yeah. Okay, so, the, so, so, so humans on Terra were seeded by aliens a long time ago. I, I yes. think so, right? Yeah. Yes. Right. And and they're the same aliens who seeded the, the planets that were focused on in The Dispossessed and all the other Hanish right. novels. Which is Tau Ceti. Okay. Yes. But so the, the Hanish, it seems like everyone except the Terrans in this book has hair on their faces, right? Everyone from Euros and Anaris does from that particular splitting off of the prime race. Yeah. And right? do the Hanish have the Hanish themselves? I don't know. Do the Hanish have that I don't hair? Remember. I don't remember them having it. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I mean, I think the idea is that they're all basically, you know, divergent human species. They're all the same species, just they've lived apart for a millennia or two, and um, but they're still the same. It's the same theory they use in Star Trek to explain why all the races <laughs> are. No, it is. It, they actually there's yeah, a yeah. whole no, there's an yeah. episode, right? So it's the same thing, though, right? There's a prime race and then, yeah, we're all sort of split off from it. Okay. And so, yeah. And so this, the story in the dispossessed is in, as Matt just mentioned, in the Tau Ceti system, which is 11 light years from earth. And there are these two planets, uh, Eris or Eurus and Anaris. And Anaris is a moon of Eurus. And the, on uh, Eurus is is sort of an earth-like planet. And it's in the middle of kind of a cold war between AIO, which is sort of like the USA, and Thu, which is sort of like the Soviet Union. And there had been a, a group of, um, of anarchists, uh, sort of nonviolent anarchists, who had moved to the moon, to Inaris, and set up a civilization there with no um, laws or governments or anything like that. And also Inaris is a much more barren, desolate desert-ish kind of world. It's basically a mining colony. Yeah. And they follow the, the uh, I don't want to, I don't know if it's religious, but they follow like the spiritual teachings of uh, a woman named Odo. 
Um, I'd call them political teachings, right? She's their Marx. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, she's, she's basically Karl Marx. I mean, and, (laughs) and, but she, she actually never sets foot on Anaris. If I, if I read the book correctly, that she died on Uras and they, the, the people who, the followers of her, like the, um, in, in order to prevent a civil war, basically they, they allowed, I don't know, what was it? 10 million people to go to this moon and live there. And they're like, fine, it's a mining colony. What do we care? You want to go live on that crappy world? Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say that Odo was sort of like Marx plus Martin Luther King. Cause she did, we are told yeah. that she led a sort of, you know, protest movement. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, but, but that, yeah, we know that she died before the protest movement, um, you know, made it off, made it off the planet. And there's a little Buddha Buddhism thrown in there too, with the, the, notion of, of suffering um yeah and in and impermanence it's 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 i go I, I know i'm messing up your your description here so go ahead david no I, i'm not, i'm just about done with that part i guess um anthony um, you're the you're the anarchist here are there any uh <laughs> anything i'm missing missing uh no i mean i i think that you know matthew's point about the her being kind of a spiritual leader as well i think does speak to the fact that the um, you know, that, that the people on and ours revere her in, in an almost spiritual way. And they, you know, quote, um, different Odo aphorisms to each other to sort of remind themselves when maybe they've strayed from her teachings or anything like that. So there is this sense that, she, that she has, that she has become almost this, um, secular saint. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I would say that in terms of, I think a lot of the, the philosophy is, basic sort of Kropotkin anarchism. I'm, I'm, I can't, you know, 20, 20 years removed from my hmm. serious anarchist days, I, I couldn't exactly disentangle who comes from what, but I think that essentially it's, it's pretty recognizable anarchist philosophy. Do you remember when you were putting stuff in your um, signatures, do you remember what any of those were, any of those quotes from the book? Um, I can actually open up a document that will have at least some of them here. Uh, the big one was, uh, God, I, why am I admitting this on a podcast? <laughs> yeah. but, but actually, this is actually a lot of these do are still very important to me. So probably the biggest one is um, a quote from Odo. Uh, the revolution is in the individual spirit or it is nowhere. It is for all or it is nothing. If it is seen as having any end, it will never truly begin. Which is which is less anarchist and more just I think what what a lot of the book becomes about towards the end of of just an idea that if you treat the revolution as okay and an end goal and a state that you have achieved then on some level you failed. Yeah. All right. So let me list. These are just like some of the primary features that jumped out to me about this civilization on Anaris. Um, the people there they speak a constructed language called Pravic. All their names are five or six letters long and are assigned randomly by computer. Uh, All the housing and meals are communal. Um, There's something, there's sort of a a bureaucracy called the Production and Distribution Coordination, PDC, that tells you what job would be most uh, useful for you to be doing right now. But all work is voluntary and you can always still eat and have housing regardless of what kind of work you do or don't do. Um, and children sleep in dormitories, sort of pub, you know, communal dormitories starting around age four. Um, so there's a couple of things that jumped out to me. Um, I guess, uh, Matt, anything else to say here about what well, it's like living on an RS? Well, I mean, reading it this time, I was kind of reminded of, um, the early 20th century, uh, kibbutzniks that moved to Palestine and Israel, because like Hebrew at that time was not, uh, you know, in the um, late 19th century, early 20th century, it was not a commonly spoken language. It was like, you know, uh, you know, Torah scholars spoke it to each other, or there was kind of a, um, you know, a pidgin Hebrew spoken on the streets of Israel or Palestine, but it wasn't a modern language like it is today. So there was an actual effort to create this language. And then like the, the, um, kibbutznik movement you know these kind of like anarch anarchist socialist farming areas were i think very much inspired by the ideas of marx and and non-property ownership and things like that um so i was like very much like oh yeah um the the thing to me like i i think you know it was it was 
weird to me that people were like, oh, this world's a utopia, right? Because I get it. Like everyone's got their, their basic needs met, you know, they're, they're pretty free sexually. They're, they're, they got food when they need to, they don't have to work if they don't want to, they still get things. But then there were also some like really, um, really big shortcomings. Like, you know, they, they had a famine and, you know, yeah, I mean like, you know, a capitalist society could have a famine too, but it seemed that they were kind of ill-equipped to, to deal with that. And, and also like, um, you know, the thing that really stood out for me was, um, I think his name was Tyr. He was a, he was a playwright and he wrote this, pl- pl- he, he like basically went insane because they didn't allow his, like his play didn't conform to what the society believed it should be. And so he, he, they sent him to, you know, whatever they called their asylum. And they all kind of had these euphemisms. Oh, he's just healing. He's just healing. But he was like obsessively rewriting this play and couldn't accept this fact that the society like rejected him. And, and it just was like, um, you know, on, you know, everyone tells each other, oh, we're, we're, we're totally free and we're, we're open and we're, you know, we, you know, this, this society is great, but then like it had a very obvious flaw in that, you know, somebody who does not conform to the society's rules is, is ostracized as an outcast. And it, it, it had no room for someone like that. And then as soon as somebody comes along who doesn't follow the rules, then it became very rigid and strict and, um, you know, um, like antagonistic to this, to this person. And, and I, I found that to be kind of, um, it's, it's biggest critique, I guess, is just how, how, how rigid they took the the rules of Odo because it, it seemed to me in a, a lot of ways that it was a fragile society. Uh, how about Lisa? What do you think of this society on Anaris? Yeah. Well, um, that's so interesting what you were saying, Matt, about, um, spoken Hebrew, that's because, you know, really, when I think about the language of Pravic, I just I associate it with Esperanto. Yeah, um, right. That constructed language um, that gained a real popularity again in the 1960s. I think if I'm remembering, William Shatner was in a movie that was shot entirely in, in Esperanto <laughs> around that same time. So so and, and of course, you know, people are getting interested in Klingon and um, you have this sort of interest in Lord of the Rings and Elvish and this interest in languages that comes up at this time. Um, that's that's I think makes sense in the new wave. Right. As science fiction is attempting to represent multiple or oh, sorry, multiple cultural perspectives. So so that's kind of uh, interesting to me about this society. And the other thing, right, is. It feels a lot, it feels so engaged with the Cold War too, right? Yeah. I mean, it's so hard not to see all of this as, um, as, 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 as playing with sort of the promises and dreams and, and, and the rhetoric of the Cold War, both in terms of Soviet and um, U.S. rhetoric, right? Um, so uh, I, I don't know where else to go with it, but just that it, it's so clearly in that moment, it's really interesting to me. Yeah, well, let me just, I didn't really get a chance to say that. I mean, I um, I was not really expecting to love this book. I mean, I, I'm interested in political theory, so I, I thought there might be some interesting stuff about that. But I, I had the sense it might be a little dull to read. But I was really blown away by this book. Uh, I, I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I, I'd say it's one of the best books I've ever read. And one of the things wow. I, I really like, one of the things I really like in science fiction is this opportunity to see a society that has never existed but that seems like it could exist and to see our society through the eyes of someone from some other society that you know some from some uh, hypothetical society and i thought that this book did that amazingly well um you know as well as any example i could think of and it's interesting you know in this this documentary i don't know if we said that the title is uh, worlds of ursula k the worlds of ursula k Le Guin. you know they talk about how her father um, was they, they say? I think they say he basically invented the academic field of anthropology. Um, but you know, was was a very very you know influential figure in that, and and that she grew up just you know with with him and all his colleagues and her mom as well, all just talking about all these different cultural practices. And so she obviously has this very 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 sophisticated understanding of of human societies and and what different um, variations they can come in. Um, and so, so like some of the stuff I really liked, so, so, so our main character, we, we said is, is this guy Shevik, who, uh, 
who is a physicist and, uh, you know, who grew up on Anaris. And so he comes to um, Urus, uh, which is, you know, basically, it's basically like the USA in the 1960s, uh, except that the women shave their heads and go topless indoors, even in formal settings. Um, but so we see a lot of their practices through his eyes. And I had one, let's see if I can find it. But um, one of the things I, I really liked was that he um, uh, he thinks that he's, he's surprised at how hard everybody works in this capitalist society, because he always imagined that the only thing that motive that the, you know, that the main thing that motivates people is, um, you know, sort of this volunteer um, instinct. And if you take that away, then people, if people were just working for money, they would just be lazy and wouldn't be motivated. And so it's just interesting how opposite a lot of the ways that he thinks are from, from what we're familiar with. Um, but, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say that, um, you know, you, you were saying that Le Guin's parents, uh, were anthropologists. I read somewhere that her, uh, her parents were friends with Oppenheimer and, you know, the guy who invented the, the bomb and Shevik, uh, Oppenheimer was an inspiration for, for Shevik actually, which I, I, I thought was pretty interesting, um, that she basically based his character, Le Guin off of, Robert Oppenheimer. Yeah, well, that's interesting because, you know, as Lisa was sort of getting at, I think that Shevik's personality is not the biggest draw no. for this novel. No, no. Um, mm -hmm. Agreed. So, <laughs> so I don't know if, and Oppenheimer, I think, was a fairly colorful character. So I don't know if, I don't know. But, but I mean, I think that, I guess the issue we could talk about with Shevik is that he's very passive. Um, and most of the book is just him thinking about stuff and the, the things that he thinks about are really interesting. Um, so I never minded too much, but, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that his, his personality is super engaging. There's actually a line, uh, I should have organized my notes better, but we get to, oh, here it is. We get to page 277. So this is almost the end of the book. And Shevik thinks he wanted to act. He had spent nearly a year now doing nothing except being a fool. It was time he did something. And I was kind of like, yeah, it is time you did something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly that same thought. Well, I, I mean, I think, um, and we haven't even mentioned it yet, but he's basically the person who invents the Ansible, right? Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, he invents the science that enables him to, to invent the Ansible. And so if you don't know, uh, and I think most people who read science fiction know this, the, the Ansible is a instantaneous communication device that uh, is used in um, a lot of Le Guin's, maybe all uh, of her Hainish books. Um, and it's, I know it's used in the left hand of darkness explicitly. And it's, it's basically, you know, they don't have to wait, you know, you send a, a signal to Tau Ceti from, from Earth, you don't have to wait 22 years for it to, to go the 11 light years and back, you get an instantaneous message. And there's this powerful moment where one of the characters is like, I, wait, I can, I can speak to my children that, you know, I left behind, and I'm not going to, you know, I left when they were babies, and I come back, they're going to be 22 years older, I can communicate with them instantly and find out what's going on in their lives. I mean, that's huge. That's huge. So, so it's just like Shevik knows, like, I've got this idea that's going to shake the foundations of physics and, you know, slowly comes to realize that the people of, of Uras, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the city state of A, A, I, O, how do you pronounce it? I, mm -hmm. Um, that they're going to basically use his idea to have a military advantage over, over all the other colonies. And, and I, I think that was like a profound, realization and you know ultimately he decides no i want this to be available to everybody to help everyone not just one one culture one 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 state you know one planet it's going to be for everybody so i i found that to be because like you know he comes from a society of non-ownership which i i think that was a nice circle there but but the idea like i think it was so fascinating for me that the first time i read it and again this time is this idea that you know he's he's a scientist and like you know, how he, he like, he knows he's close to something, but he just can't, can't quite get it at first. So he does other things and then he comes back to it. And he's got it all in his head. He knows he's just got to do the, the hard work to get it out on paper. And like, 
I, I thought like, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I, I mean, like I, I'm a programmer, I'm a coder and a writer, but like that part of it, um, that part of it seemed real to me. I, I mean, I don't know how, yeah. how you guys feel. Well, yeah, I'm not a scientist either, but my, my parents are both scientists and my dad's a physicist. And it, it, it just felt very, very well done, I thought, in this. The, there's there's actually a scene where he he has this epiphany, you know, the he, he in this sort of feverish state, he, he comes up with the, the last part, you know, the last key for his theory and everything and all that stuff. It just felt so true to me. Um, and of course, this is since this is like futuristic physics, it's all like kind of, you know, uh, sort of techno babble in a sense but it's it's really really well done um i i, I totally yeah. i totally bought that this is you know what a scientist a physicist a physicist in the future who invents faster than light and, stuff and, yeah go ahead. and you know i mean what's cool about this too is that when Le Guin comes up with the ansible she's actually solving a big narrative problem in science fiction right which is that we love to tell stories about of intergalactic scope and yet physics over the course of the 20th century has taught us that like uh we probably can't travel faster than light and we and or communicate faster than light right and so science fiction wants to narrate it as if we can be in all these spaces at once right like the way uh star wars does right um but we our science tells us we can't and Le Guin comes up with a way to sort of make science fiction work again in sort of sciencey sounding terms right and i think that that's really cool and everyone uses the ansible in their science fiction once she creates it like it's critical to someone like orson scott card later on um and it's it's a really neat way to solve a problem that otherwise was going to really make science fiction tricky for people like because otherwise right you can't talk to your children and you can't tell these neat narratives we're no longer telling narratives on a human scale and the ansible allows us to bring things back to the human scale because you can talk to your kids even if they're galaxies away yeah, I guess I also we should set up that sort of the, the structure of the book is that um, it alternates chapters and half the chapters are flashbacks to Shavik's life on Anaris. And then half of them are what happens to him after he comes from uh, Anaris to, to Urus, because he's hoping to kind of the, 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 these two societies have been really not in contact for the last two centuries. And he's hoping to sort of open things up and um create a dialogue um doesn't go that well um <laughs> but so so anthony you want to say more about so you um what was it like um re rereading this like did it seem different i i would say that i mean one of the things that strikes me every time um because i sort of i think it gets a little bit lost in sort of the haze of memory is to Matt's point, how much of the sections on Anaris don't feel utopian, and um, that that a lot of the the dramatic, in as much as there is drama, particularly towards the end of those uh, Anaris sections, it's about Shevik in conflict with uh, the the authorities at, on Anaris. Which I mean, part of that is the the fact that they're not supposed to have authorities at all, but in fact they do have de facto. Uh, they do have a de facto government in some ways. And so in as much as Anaris feels like a utopia, and a lot of times it's more a utopia in retrospect because it's when he goes to Urus um, and sees how much he really doesn't like the capitalist society there that um, and, and that because of the things he was brought up with on Anaris, uh, that he can sort of see the, all the things that are kind of wrong um, with, with Urus. Um, that then he's, I think, starts to appreciate Anaris more in some ways. Although I think those those critiques still still sting and still are true. And and um, I, I, you know, that I am absolutely some obviously somebody who took away from the novel the first time a uh, kind of pro anarchist message. And my sense is that um, I think in her early discussions of the book, Le Guin was a little bit coy about this. But as time went on, you know, she's because she didn't want people to just see it as like propaganda. But that, like, you know, in her mind, Anaris is clearly the the better planet and the thing that is closer to a utopia. But it's not, you know, perfect. And and I think that's it. Every time, it's like very striking to me that I I can see all these flaws in Anaris, and yet there's still a part of me that that very much responds to it and wants to be there. 
Well, it, it's very clear reading this that Le Guin had some firsthand knowledge of a vicious academic faculty politics. <laughs> um, so, uh, Lisa, do you want to yeah. you want to touch on that? Well, first of all, uh, <laughs> academics are usually even more subtle and evil, I would say, in their uh, politics. <laughs> so it's a bit of a dramatization, uh, but that's you know fiction for you, so that's cool. Um, Oh, gosh, now I forgot what I was going to say before. It's okay. Uh, so bounce it to someone else, and I'll see if I remember what I was going to say. I'm sure it was brilliant, but and it will come back to me. <laughs> well, let me say about the the academic politics, because, yeah, because, um, you know, um, in the, this is a society where there's supposedly no hierarchy, but we see that, and part of the message of the novel, I guess, is that, you know, just sort of social pressure creates all of these hierarchies, even when they're not supposed to exist. And so Shevik has this nasty um, colleague, uh, Sobel, who's constantly undermining him and jealous of him and stealing credit and uh, stymieing him, his research and all this stuff. And um, uh, <laughs> and so there, there's this there's this part where this is when Sobel fired. He's he's effectively he's fired um, Shevik uh, after doing everything he can to undermine him for for years. And Sobel says. There was a certain feeling, not necessarily justified, but existing among many student and teaching members of the Institute that both your teaching and your behavior reflect a certain disaffection, a, certain, a degree of primitivism, of non-altruism. Mm -hmm. This was spoken of in meeting. I spoke for you, of course, but I'm only one syndic among many. <laughs> so he's just this like slimy guy who's just pretending like, oh, I was, you know, everybody just says you're awful. And I was trying to stick up for you when you know that he's the one. He's the primary driver of all this. Um, I also want to highlight there's um, uh, uh, Shevik and his wife have this, um, or, or partner, I guess, have this um, uh, awful <laughs> neighbor, uh, and this is Banub, uh, and it says, she had a mind both insidious and invidious, which could find the bad in anything and take it straight to her bosom. The factory where she worked was a poisonous mass of incompetence, favoritism, and sabotage. Meetings of her syndicate were bedlams of unrighteous innuendo all directed at her. The entire social organism was dedicated to the persecution of Benab. So we see that, yeah, there are, this is no utopia, that when you have people like this around, um, you know, things are going to get ugly no matter what sort of <laughs> so, uh, convent social convention. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I actually remember what I wanted to talk about here. I like first personally that Anaris is not perfect. Right. And I feel like um, one thing Le Guin wants to do, right. Is reorient us to the, to what utopia is. There's a tendency, especially I think in the United States to think about utopia as an end point, right. And yeah. a place. Right. And it's like, and that's why it's easy to launch these critiques like, Oh, that's utopian thinking. It's unrealistic. It will never get there. Well, duh, right? Um, but you know, as uh, you know, as, as Stan, as Le Guin reminds us, and as Stan Robinson reminds us, right, that utopia is is about a process rather than a place. And I think that that's my favorite thing about this book is it really shows you that first of all, the process of getting to a utopia is boring. It's so boring. It's so much work, and it's so much talk, and it's so much thought, and like there's nothing Flash Gordon about it, which I think is super cool, right? And then, like, at the end, as they say, there will always be another Anaris. Like, this never ends, this process. Like, we're humans. We're not perfect. And we're always going to evolve ideas about where the next utopian goalpost lies. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I've been on a lot of uh, panels at various conventions about, you know, uh, optimistic science fiction and solar punk and uh, utopias. And I, I always say, you know, utopia is a verb. It's not a noun, right? It's something you work towards. It's nice. not something that's final. Yeah. And, and I, I think yeah. that, um, you know, Le Guin says that pretty, pretty clearly. And it, it with, with Odo's voice in this, in the sense that, you know, when you have an end point, then, then you failed. Right. So it's like something you have yes. to keep working towards. And I, I think it, it's very clear to me that, you know, Le Guin was saying like, all human societies are flawed, right? So like even even the Hainish and the the Terrans, you know, at the end, who who come in and kind of uh rescue Shevik, you know, uh from from the chaos, uh they say, look, you know, we uh, we we basically killed our planet. Like like, you know, we we destroyed Earth. Like there used to be nine billion of us. Now there's now there's I forgot how many they said was left, like five hundred million or something. Yeah. You know, and 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 it's like, yeah, like like you know, we're messed up too. Like everybody's messed up. And, and I, I think that, um, 
you know, if, if any message could be taken from this, it's like, yeah, like everything requires work. And, and I, I think, you know, reading through this again, I saw there, there were parts of, um, you know, the, the, um, Anara society that I was like, oh, that's, that's really great. That's really nice. And and there were parts of the Ura society that I was like, oh, you know, like, I, I think that, you know, um, you know, there are certain elements of a capitalist society that, that are, might be better than, than, uh, you know, this purely anarchist society. But, but also I, I think that part of it too was that, um, Anaris is, is, is basically like a world of scarcity, right? So, so, um, they have very few, um, like, I don't think they have any native animals on the planet. Right. And that's right. And, and they only have like this holum tree. And it seemed to me, it was just like, like, I don't know if it was a pure desert, but I, I was imagining like, you know, kind of the, the American Southwest, like the, there's some scrub and there's some plants, but it's pretty bare. And, you know, I, I was wondering, it made me wonder, like, what would this society be like if they had a planet that was full of plants and animals and abundance, like would, there would probably be another culture and, you know, it would probably have its beautiful parts and have its ugly parts. And I, I think that's, that's the narrative yeah. that Le Guin was was going for that that there is no perfect society. Well, um, doesn't doesn't she actually answer that, Matt? Because we learn at some point late in the book that actually, because uh, we all assume Eurus is the primary Earth and that Anaris is the Moon, right? The secondary settled place. But we learn that when people first came to that solar system, they were on Anaris first. And it sucked yeah. and they went to <laughs> Eurus. So we know what those people would be like if they had a more plentiful world they, 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 because they go to Eurus <laughs> to get it, right? And I love that reversal in the book. I think that's really interesting. And I'm never quite sure what to do with it. I mean, maybe it just, um, it, it, you never know the full story, right? That's her point. There's always more to learn. There's always these reversals and these changes in your perspective. But also how each, each other, um, each culture sees the other one as the moon. Right. Yes. Like, you know, yes. You know, oh, that's our moon. That's, yes. you know, we're here, but that's our moon. Right. Yeah. Just in like a purely visual sense, like that we look up in the sky and that's what we see. Yeah. Yeah. To your point, Matt, let me just read. This is uh, one of the characters. This is one of the professors. Oh, yeah. He says, or it, this is his, his, it describes his argument. It says the Adonian society called itself anarchistic, he said, but they were in fact mere primitive populists whose social order functions without apparent government because there were so few of them and because they had no neighbor states. When their property was threatened by an aggressive rival, they would either wake up to reality or be wiped out. The Benbili rebels were waking up to reality now. They were learning freedom is not good if you have no guns to back it up. And there is, I mean, I guess there's sort of a, a a sense of artificiality where in order to make this um, sort of society seem to function, it has to be on this kind of desolate desert planet where, um, you know, the same professor, I think, asks Shevik, what, what if, what do you do about robbery and stuff? And he says, well, there's nothing really worth stealing. So there's not, we don't really have a problem with robbery, but, but so there is this sense that, you know, that you have to have these pretty specific parameters for this sort of, um, for this sort of society to seem to function at all. Um, I guess, do you agree with that, Anthony? Because you said you were really um, sort of inspired by this, right? So kind of what were you Yeah, imagining? I would say so. And I mean, I agree with everything that Matt said. I, I think that obviously it's critiquing both societies. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't want that to, to me at least, it's, it's not that she's drawing an equivalence between the two that I think, it, you know, uh, I think that Anaris is clearly the preferable society and sort of has achieved more, equity and justice and, 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 you know, it is, is just a better place in a lot of ways, despite the scarcity than, than us. And I mean, it's funny cause I, I, um, actually the years after I live, I read the dispossessed, I spent the, the next few years in college living in, um, a co-op, uh, that not surprisingly came out of sixties and seventies counterculture. And every decision was supposed to be made by consensus you weren't required to use, but it was sort of understood that no one locked their doors. And so theoretically, people, anyone could have walked in and stolen all of our computers and we just had a system. I mean, we just sort of trusted that that wasn't going to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do think that, I mean, the quote that you had about the um, the professor critiquing how scalable an is, whether it would, you know, survive, you know, real armed conflict with, with another culture, 
Uh, I mean, I think it's a good point. I don't know that we're meant to take it at face value because I think most of the academics that uh, Shevik encounters on Urus turn out to be blinkered or self-serving in, in various ways. Um, but but I do think it is an open question of like, is, you know, can can the the model, with the model that Anaris have, has like work with a larger society? Would it work in the context of, you know, the the broader interstellar civilization. And um, I don't think the, the book answers that, uh, but there's certainly some suggestions that it, that it wouldn't, that it only works because it's, it's fel- relatively isolated and, um, you know, a, a fairly homogenous population of people who have all been brought up with and inculcated with, with these values. Um, although I think part of what the book also indicates is that, that Anaris has value even beyond as a, beyond being a functioning society, which it does on a small scale, um, in inspiring those on, on other planets, particularly on Urus, where, you know, there, there are a government that maybe is not as fully anarchistic as Anaris claims to be, but, you know, they, they can point to Anaris and say, we want to be like that. And, and even I think the Hainish representative says, in some ways, we are mm-hmm. inspired and frightened of you. Yeah. In fact, that's why the one Hainish guy at the end wants to stay on the planet and become the first person to cross over the wall, remember? I mean, right. I, I think that actually right at the end, what we find is that Anaris is rich in one resource and it's inspiration. And and right, exactly. like everyone in this yeah. world responds to that. And I love it, it, but you know, and I think about it, especially in the current political landscape. And I feel like Le Guin is writing out this moment when you can still really imagine like this enlightenment world where everyone's going to act like rationally and in the interest of the group rather than just the individual, right? Like, honestly, if you think about the grand structure of the acumen, like, honestly, uh, Anaris couldn't hope for a better launch into interstellar society than that particular one. It's not uh, the Star Trek Federation, and it's certainly not anything extrapolated out of our current sociopolitical set of relations. So... You know, Anari's now good luck surviving like Earth's <laughs> political um, structures. But, <laughs> but the ecumen, there's some hope, right? Like they're a little bit, they're older. They've seen everything. They are, they're, they're a little chiller about stuff. It's funny when you mentioned the inspiration. I mean, I remember when I interviewed Le Guin, one of the things I asked her about was that there had been a story in the news about how protesters, like left wing protesters, had these sort of like plastic shields um, with the cover on which, you know, they had printed or painted the cover of The Dispossessed. Oh, wow. So it was really, you know, in a very direct way, inspiring people. And and in that documentary, um, one of the one of the people that they interview um, says, you know, everyone I talk to in, you know, left-wing organizing protest movements, I, I tell them they have to read The Dispossessed. She says, this is the, this is the book that like, gets at the questions that we're trying to solve. Um, so I thought that was really, that was really interesting. You know, that makes so much sense because the one thing I really thought this time when I reread it was how much this reminded me of the riots in Portland over the course of this summer and how much I was like, yeah, you can tell Le Guin is out of the same culture that that brought you the protests, right? Not even the riots, the protests, yeah. the legal well, and Le Guin and Le- illegally uh, stopped protests. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that Le Guin lived in Portland, too. If right, don't, exactly. That's don't my point. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Does Isn't Length of Heaven in Portland, in fact? Pretty sure it's set in Portland. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Um, I was also going to say that when Matt was talking about, um, you know, Hasidic communities, it was this This kind of reminds me of the Amish a little bit, too. And I guess that was one of the the slight plausibility issues I, I had was that I feel like, from what I understand, part of the reason that the Amish... Um, community is able to function the way that it does is because anyone who doesn't like it is able to leave Um, and that they're actually pretty, you know, that I think they actually encourage people to leave for a while and they only want you in the community if you choose to, to come back and and choose to live this life. And the way this is set up, there isn't that um, kind of release valve or whatever, you know, nobody's allowed to go to, um, to Urus, you know, um, Shevik's the first one. So I guess I was a, it was a little bit of a plausibility issue to me that this society would function as well as it does, that there wouldn't be more malcontents or mm. sectarian conflicts or, you know, just people who were born but, into the society who are like, I don't like this program. I don't want to be but, involved. But we, but we learn that there are, right? And that they're massaged away, right? They're, they're, they're healed. 
in, in the most scary of all ways, right? They're, they're sent to therapy until things right. are resolved, right? I mean, we do learn that those people exist. And I would think that that Shevik's realization that like a few of his friends, like that this, they were, that this had happened to them, like that's the tip of a bigger iceberg, I would assume. I, I sort of felt that was what was being implied there, right? Is there's I a mean, history. Yeah, I, I mean, even Shevik himself, right? Because his ideas yeah. are kind of suppressed and, oh no, we can't can't send this over to them. And um, yeah, no, absolutely. And that's why it goes to Urus eventually. Right. And, and that they they frame it as, if, if I recall correctly, that technically no one has the authority to stop you, but um, A, we don't have to let you back in and we don't have to like protect you if you come back. And also that custom has basically been the barrier for, for anyone else leaving for the past century and a half. And, yeah. and to Dave's point, maybe that would, that's not entirely plausible and that there would have been more, not merely sort of, you know, people who are sort of exiled or institutionalized or whatever, but, but people, peop, if the door is only closed because of custom, then more people might've stepped through it. Yeah. I mean, just because yeah, you say there, there's no rules doesn't mean there aren't any rules. Right. 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 Um, but I, I also think like from a, writer standpoint sometimes you your story has a certain conceit and in order to tell the story you want to tell you have to just set up the the chess pieces a certain way right and you know i think that you know if Le Guin got caught up in how the um anara society like collapsed and it, it didn't hold together and th that's not the story she was trying to tell right so right. she's like, all right, well, well, yeah, it's got some flaws, but that's, that's not exactly what I'm trying to do here. And, and so, you know, but I, I think like what she did tell, uh, she told extremely well, right? I mean, in, in that documentary, we all saw, it was, she was talking about how she was reading about anarchist societies and, and, you know, you, you were saying like people put the, the book cover on, on their shields when that, when they're protesting. I mean, it's, it's really effective, right? Um, as a, as a work. So I, I think sometimes that, you know, when we, when we analyze uh, fiction, you know, with a magnifying glass, we can always find little cracks here and there and say, Oh, well, what about this? What about that? And, right. you know, that, that, that's, I don't think necessarily that's what Le Guin was trying to do. I don't, I don't think that's what she was trying to do specifically. Um, and, and so I, I'm willing to forgive, you know, when, little pieces in the background may not fit together perfectly. I, I think that's okay. It's funny. I'm willing to forgive that too, except I'm going to be a dork here. I actually think she does resolve it because you might remember at one point, Shevik's partner says, if this keeps up, like the harassment against the family, we're going to just go to the mountains where no one cares about this and everyone does their own thing. So there is an implication that there's an mm -hmm. already sort of an Anaris beyond Anaris. Like there are these mountain yeah, communities right. that are not plugged in to the rest of the communities. So so I actually kind of think she does solve that problem for herself yeah, yeah. Um, as we're talking here, which is interesting. But I totally agree with you on the big point. Although, again, let's think about this. Like, like let's be science fiction dorks. Sure, you don't want to live on Anaris anymore. You don't agree with the situation. How are you going to get somewhere else? Like, physically tell me how that's going to happen. In a scarcity society where there seem to be very few vehicles and very few ways to get away. You know what I mean? Like... Well, so I think what does happen, yeah, is that you don't go anywhere. I mean, I guess that you have to convince someone at Urus to take you or you suffer the way all of Shevek's friends did, that you you try to, to you know, resolve something, the, the conflict within yourself and society that cannot be resolved. Right. Or you go to the mountains, as his as his uh, partner yeah, suggests. But yeah, but, you're, but, um, but like if you think about it, right, especially in the, even in the 60s, we're so used to like instant communication and, and pretty easy travel, like dudes, it hasn't always been that simple to get from point A to point B. And even today, it's not depending on your status, right? Well, well, but I, I, my, my concern was more that without this release, what would build up? And I mean, I guess, oh, I see. you know, got you. Got you. I, I mean, um, you know, it, it just seems to me that like, where's the like organized crime? Like, I mean, you know, like, like, it seems like a society like this depends on a certain amount of people being of going with the program. And that, you know, it wouldn't take very many people not going with the program to make the thing break down. For, for example, we're told that, you know, like Shevik gets uh, dessert once a week or something like that. Yeah. And right. it's like, are there not, is there not anyone who just like wants dessert more than once a week and is willing to, you know, use uh, coercive right. means to, to get stuff like that? And is, well, they do show the market 
the breakdown with with the, the you know the the uh, famine right and then like people are dying in the trains and um right but 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 this society has been around for 170 years apparently with no big you know no um, mass outbreaks of violence or revolutions or civil wars right wars well or... I, I think part of the question is like do the you know like the question of like how many how large would the disaffected population be, right? Because I think in, in what we see, it, it's it's individuals, scattered individuals. And in that sense that, yes, if people sort of game the system or don't fit in or, or what have you, um, you know, a society can still function like that. I mean, again, to sort of draw the very small scale example of the, the co-op I lived in that ran by consensus <laughs> and we decided where we lived. Like you, like every decision about every decision had to be a making sense, including who got which room, who got the singles. And there were absolutely people that gamed that system that they just said, I am not leaving this, you know, meeting unless I get one of the single, you know, the single rooms. Um, and that sucks and it's horrible, but you can still have a functioning system that way. Um, but like if all 50 people in the house feel that way, then you don't have a functioning society. Right. So I think part of the conceit is that the numbers are low enough that you, that, you know, probably some people are, are not behaving in true Odonian spirit, but, but not enough to, to, to have the society fall apart. But, you know, I, I hear you, but I'm now I'm thinking about what Dave said and I see his point, like 10 million people is enough for you to have an organized crime syndicate. If every, if there's enough people who want dessert more than once a week or whatever. Right. I mean, even the Amish have a mafia, like, you know, we were comparing them to the Amish earlier and, all, you know, all of these cultures have their own internal police and stuff or, and their own internal crime units. So, yeah, it is interesting. I think it's kind of impressive that 10 million people could not could manage for 200 years without organized crime. Um, I mean, maybe I maybe it maybe it's there. The water. That's true. <laughs> right. Well, right. I mean, maybe it's yeah. there. Maybe it's but like, again, maybe Le Guin is like, you know, if I start talking about that, the book's going to diverge into a different thing. And that's not the story that she was trying to tell like it, maybe That's maybe true. it's just like like maybe there is organized crime maybe there yeah, maybe yeah. there are parts of the society like we already saw these parts that are like little pieces are hinting that there's pro there's larger you problems know? here that they're not addressing but she's like no like I, like that that's you another know, we, book that's another story i think we basically all want harlan ellison to come write some fan fiction in this world right to sort of dirty <laughs> yeah. it up a little bit <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and, and Matt, I mean, I'm, this is not really a criticism of this book. I mean, I think, it, like I said, I think it's an absolutely phenomenal book. And I, 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 it's hard for me to even think of a book that show that portrays such a different society with such authority and with such believability. I mean, I think it's, it's the left hand incredible. of darkness. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'm, I need to get to that bit. one. Yeah, yeah. But, but um, I think it's absolutely an incredible book. So my, 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 my point is more just like, you know, I, I have doubts about whether any kind of anarcho-syndicalist society like this would actually function with 10 million people. That that even this level of craft and thoughtfulness doesn't really persuade me. Um, so, but but that's more more my point is just I have questions about the the basic premise more so than Le Guin's um, you know instantiation of it. But I think maybe. You know, for me, this is part of why I liked Joanna Russ better as a kid and why maybe even still today, I think I, I, in some ways, emotionally, I find it more appealing. Like, even when she tries to imagine utopias and dystopias, they're sort of complicated, like her utopias, like, right, JL and Womanland, she hates all the other Womanlanders, and she's always pulling really mean pranks on them. Like, I don't know, it just feels very human in a way that I miss in Le Guin. I sort of want to see the pranks and, and the other side of humanity sometimes. Well, and that Shevik in particular is well, yeah, Shevik like said, is sort of so flat and passive in in a lot of ways, and um, it, in some ways, I mean, it is that's fine because he's simply the eyes through which we're seeing Anars and and or us, um, right? But like, there are little things where, um, like, they t there's a scene sequence where they talk about how he's actually incredibly popular despite the fact that he he talks to no one and has apparently <laughs> no real right. warmth, and I'm not sure I completely believe that though i do understand some people are incredibly charismatic without uh being superficially outgoing um but i i, I yeah i agree that like there's something about um Shevik and and his marriage and his family that that doesn't really feel three-dimensional in the way that i think the political components of of the novel do he doesn't show joy very often 
I felt. His relationships to women are one dimensional in the most horrifying of ways. And that's all yeah. I maybe have well, to say about that. Both to it, <laughs> Without I, going too deep into gosh. it, I will say that one thing, scene that I cannot, that's really, really difficult to read now is um, there's a scene where he, there's been a woman he's been flirting with on, on Urus and he gets invited to her party and, uh, and he gets really drunk and forces himself on her. And the way that scene is written and the way he reacts to it afterward very much paints the woman as the one at fault there. And that to me, like just seems insane. And like that, you know, to like, it's very clearly to me, uh, like sexual well, har harassment and assault right there. And like, it's a it, beyond that it's a rape scene. You know, my students just read it yeah. and they're like, it's a rape scene. And that was not cool. And it's not cool. And what I'll tell you what else is not cool is the is the insu insinuation in the book. And it's just the one thing I don't like. I like everything else in this book, but this is this is I finally realized what bugs me is that Shevik's entire character is predicated on the fact that his mother wanted to pursue her own work and her own dream, just like her son, but she had to abandon her baby boy. And he's very sad about that for all his life. And I'm sorry, guys, but <sighs> enough. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a whole lot of edible stuff that i don't know that's all i'm gonna say well can we talk about the critical response to the book because you know i just finished reading it yesterday i didn't have time really to read any of the responses or secondary materials or anything but anthony you said that um samuel r delaney had this sort of great response to it um is there anything you want to say about that or or any other sure i mean yeah, it's, it's, it's this essay called To Read the Dispossessed, which is in uh, his collection, The Jewel Hinged Jaw. And I mean, in a lot of ways, the, the same way that like The Dispossessed is like a really foundational book for me, as far as novels go, I think that essay is really foundational for me and how I think about criticism, because it's it's a clear that he, I mean, it's it's less about whether or not he likes or dislikes the book, because I think, if anything, maybe you come away with the impression that he thinks it's a bit overrated, but um, it even feeling that it's that he feels like it's a book worth engaging with. Like it's, a, I forget, like 50 or 60 page essay where he goes in, in a lot of detail about some of the other shortcomings of the book that I think are are real and we haven't maybe gone in, into as much, but that it's very much, you know, despite being this quote unquote anarchist revolutionary book, it, it's very into the like heterosexual married yes. traditional family unit. The one queer character is not portrayed very convincingly um, and is, is marginalized in a lot of ways. Um, and, and so there are a lot of things about it that are not entirely persuasive. Um, but I think that the way, he, the way he ends the essay is by saying that when you read the book as somebody who's young, you might just be totally blown away by it. When you're a little bit more older, older and more sophisticated, you might come at it and be disappointed. But then when you're still more mature than that, you'll see that just the ambition of the thing is itself incredibly worthwhile. Oh my God, that's almost exactly my reaction. Except <laughs> I felt opposite politically the first time, but I was over being a feminist. So there you go. But um, <laughs> that's great though. That's so cool. Didn't Delaney write Dahlgren as both a response and a correction to, but also an inspired by kind of thing? I think Dahlgren is supposed to be in dialogue with the dispossessed, right? Because hers is I think is Triton an even more so. Utopia. Or maybe it's Triton, whichever is the one that is the header... One one of them has also yeah. Has Triton is the ambiguous the heterotopia. That's it. That's it. Right. So Triton is the response. My my apologies, not Dal Dahlgren. Um, although they both work ultimately. Right. Uh, I guess I want to get Matt back in here. Matt, do you have any uh, anything you've been wanting to say? Um, yeah, I mean, th you know that that scene I definitely read as as a rape scene, and it squicked me out, and I was like, oh my god, like I can't believe that. Le Guin wrote this and um yeah I mean <sighs> I can't believe Shevik had the, the energy to do anything personally but <laughs> yeah yeah exactly I mean it, like Shevik it, it's interesting because Shevik's a protagonist but to me he's not really the most interesting character at all I mean it's it's yeah. to be, the characters to me are the the two worlds right those are those are the mm. and oh, like every, everybody else is kind of like little pieces of the personality of those worlds. And he's, he's just kind of the dialogue between the two of them. So he's, he's that, yeah. I, I feel like that's why he's so passive and, well, I, you know, I guess none of the characters are that vivid to me. I mean, a lot of times, like I was even like sort of a little vague on who, you know, like, I, I don't know if I could tell you anything about could, could really distinguish the different members of the faculty at the Institute or, or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, 
you know, it, so it's, it's, it, yeah, it's not a book to me where the colorful characters or, or the naturalistic dialogue is particularly a strength. You know, it's, it is really about the, the politics and the ideas. Um, but the politics and the ideas are so interesting to me that, yeah. uh, you know, that's enough for me well, in this case. Pamela, yeah. Didn't Pamela Sargent right around that same time said, di- talked about science fiction as a literature of ideas rather than a literature of character. And I feel like this is a book that definitely uh, embodies that particular idea. Yeah. But it's also, it's really beautifully written. I mean, just the, um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, a oh, lot yeah. of a lot of science fiction that you would call a literature of ideas is kind of, you know, workmanlike oh, in its not prose. This, and, no. and this is, you know, yeah. just yeah. every sentence is beautifully wrought. Yeah. Well, um, well, and Dave, you mentioned the uh, the documentary, the, and one of the things that was really striking to me that I wasn't expecting get, to get out of it is I think that in my head, I'd previously had this idea of Le Guin inventing all these societies, you know, Anaras and Earthsea and, and all the other sort of f- from whole cloth from her incredible imagination, but like realizing um, how much of those at least start in some way from like the, the kind of natural landscapes of, of Oregon and California. And like, I think so much of the beautiful writing in the book is just about, I mean, a lot of it is about the ideas, but some of it is, is about the landscape as well. Now, wasn't Dune inspired by Oregon as well? If yes. I that, yes. That's that's amazing, right? It's like interesting. like some of the great science fiction. Now I got to I've never been to the state. I, I need to visit. Mm-hmm. I need to. Go I, I was on a road trip once, and we drove past the dunes that I believe you know Frank Herbert was was writing about yeah. non fictionally and then fictionally. And then I tried to convince my friend to stop, but he was be listen. This is about Dune. Did not convince <laughs> him. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Um, actually, Lisa, you uh, you emailed us saying that uh, there's a, a bunch of really great Le Guin resources at this link. And again, I didn't get a chance really to to go through that. But is there anything you want to say about any of that? Oh, I, my goodness. It has been such an action-packed week, Dave. I have to tell you, I don't remember exactly which links I sent you all. Can you remind me which ones they were? Um, it was like a New oh, Yorker I know profile. What it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, actually, I suspect a lot of the links I sent came from the Library of America. As as uh, many of you may know, the Library of America has been uh, republishing all of Le Guin's works, including the very early uh, historical fantasies. And uh, so, you know, while she was alive, she did a lot of work with the Library of America. And so they were putting together a lot of resources. And it's a really great center. And I think that all of the articles that I sent you to either whether they were, for instance, in the New Yorker or um, elsewhere, can, are all collated and archived on the Library of America page. So I would just say that for people who are interested in learning more about her, um, that that's a great resource to go to, both uh, if you want to get her books and also just if you want to see all these other great articles and uh, see a lot of links to the way that she really was truly a public intellectual. That's the point that people made in the documentary that I think I would just want to repeat right here and is my favorite thing about Ursula Le Guin ever is she is science fiction's best ambassador to the rest of the world ever. And uh, she has done more for showing people why this is an important genre and maybe the mode of literature we need to navigate our way into a very uncertain future than anyone else ever will. Totally agree with that. You know, it's, it's like you sometimes get certain, um, literary circles that poo poo on science fiction i mean e- even the new yorker article i mean that, that could be a whole panel in itself but th- yeah. there's a quote I, re- I wrote down if science fiction was down market it was at least a market and then <laughs> the, the other quote was her editor charles mcgraw saw in her an ability to transform genre fiction into something oh, yeah. higher and I, i'm just like, like i read these and i'm like you know they're, they're basically writing this profile of one of the greatest science fiction authors of you know if not the greatest of the 20th century. And then they still can't resist, you know, shitting on and science fiction. And, and I was it's like, crazy come on. Because it's really disrespectful to Le Guin, who yes. never allowed herself to be labeled as anything other than a science fiction writer and in the yeah, best of all ways. Yeah. You know, and, and it seems to me that, um, you know, so-called realist fiction, like if you're ignoring uh, science fictional tropes, you're ignoring reality, right? So we, we have supercomputers in our in our pockets that 
connect to satellites. Um, we have artificial intelligence that decides what we see every day. We 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 have you know video conferences with people that like we're, we're living in a science fiction world. You know, we, we're like NASA's going to the moon again, and we're planning Mars. We have a probe on Mars. A helicopter's going to fly on Mars in the next week or two. Like we're living in a science fiction world. So it's like if if you ignore this, you know, maybe you're the one who's the fantasist, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And, um, and I think what, that also makes me think of, you know, something I'd read about um, Le Guin in, in the, I think, I don't know if this is actually true, but but I think John Clute in an essay about her mentioned this idea that at a certain point, um, four out of every five uh, dissertations about science fiction were either about Ursula Le Guin or Philip K. Dick. And, <laughs> um, and, and that certainly anecdotally feels right in the sense of that there was a period um, that I think we've, we've kind of moved out of a little bit where they were the two that were like beloved by the, the Academy. And as I mean, it's hard to generalize about these sorts of things, but like, um, and, and that there was a sense that you would, even if you were somebody who poo pooed science fiction, you would say, well, you know, Philip K. Dick and Ursula Le Guin are, are okay, but they're not really writing science fiction. They're writing something else. Um, and, and I think that that does no to the same point that everyone else is saying, like that does them no favors. Cause I mean, they clearly come out of that tradition and, I certainly think they are exemplify what is best about science fiction and are some of the best writers to come out of the genre, but that, you know, separating them from it or, or treating them as something fundamentally different, I think, misses the point entirely. All right, well, let me ask you guys about this. So if you look at the Wikipedia page under, you know, like uh, responses or reviews or whatever, it's mostly positive, but it also says, Lester Del Rey, however, gave the novel a mixed review citing the quality of Le Guin's writing, but claiming that the ending slips badly, a deus ex machina that destroys much of the strength of the novel. Mm. Um, I liked the ending myself, but I was just curious if anyone else felt that the ending was a, a deus ex machina. I, I think that Le Guin, I mean, you mean in terms of like the, the her going to the, the Hainish embassy and getting whisked away? Um, I, get, I mean, yeah, I, I think it could either mean, yeah, well, so what happens at the end is that Shevet goes to the is it the to the Terran Embassy, isn't it? Um, I think it's the Terran Embassy. The Terran yes, embassy. I think it's Terran. Yeah. Um, and, and so, sort of like you know, the the sort of action story is is solved that way. But um, it, so it could mean that, or it could also just mean that he kind of like goes to this other planet and starts a whole revolution and everything, and then just goes home and is happy going home, and that that's kind of could be seen, I guess, as a sort of cop out. I didn't um, see it that way. I, I mean, you know. The the other option would be that uh, if if Shevik didn't escape and then had to deal with the consequences of it, and then I think you would need a, a you know a second book to describe because <laughs> you can't you can't just like you know end end it like that. It, and so I think that by doing that, um, Le Guin I don't think Le Guin is saying that the problems are solved at all. I think Le Guin's just saying that Shevik got out of the situation, but the situation between those two worlds are still very tense. So I think that that's interesting that it's Lester Del Rey. I'm actually putting together a new book right now on, on uh, women's science fiction in the 1970s. And one thing I found is that Judy Del Rey was a real, um, she was not a fan of the new wave. <laughs> and I, my guess is Lester Del Rey probably wasn't either because they had very similar editing styles. And that's actually the period where they got together too, I know. Um, I think the Del Rey's, they were really inter, you know, invested in classic science fiction and they wanted Shevik to be a hero who does something, right? And I, I can see where that critique comes from, from that kind of perspective. If you, if you want your science fiction to be classic science fiction with an active hero who does something to actually make the revolution happen and make the utopia happen, like that's, I personally think the beauty of this book is you don't get that, right? That you're frustrated in those simple answers, right? It's much harder and, and much less interesting than that. And that's what actually makes it fascinating, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, it's me, complicated. Not, me not knowing uh, what happened to any, of the, any other books in the series, I was wondering if there was a follow-up to The Dispossessed dealing with the what happens after this book. Because, you know, it gets, to, it gets to be like 100 pages from the end and all of a sudden, uh, Shevik's kind of starting a revolution and there's clearly not enough pages left for this to, to be really, you know, developed in, in any detail. So uh, it would not, it would not have surprised me if there had been a follow-up, but. Um, I, don't, I don't remember any more. There's a prequel. Yeah. Right. 
uh, and then everyone has the Ansible after that. About Odo. And, There's a prequel yeah. about Odo and the revolution. The day yes, after the, the day before the day before or before. the day after the revolution. The day before the, day before the revolution. The revolution. Yeah. Yep. But I guess technically most of the Hainish novels are sequels to this in the sense that they take place after the creation of the Ansible, but I don't think yes. any of them deal with what happened to Anaris or, or us. No, they're just like, then suddenly there's an Ansible. And I believe like people mentioned Shevik, you know, as a scientist in history, he becomes like Einstein, like a figure in mm -hmm. history, right? Which is pretty cool, actually. Since... I think you mean Eisenstein. Eisenstein, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> So that's, and that's why he goes to the Terrans, right? Because he's so like drawn to the myth of Eisenstein. Um, and, and that's why he goes to them in the end. Does anyone uh, remember that Odo prequel well enough to, do, do you recommend it or does it cast any interesting light on? I haven't read it. Possessed? I didn't read it. Same. My <laughs> students are rereading it right now. Ironically, I haven't read it yet. They're ahead of me on this one. Um, and what's interesting is I'm finding is that while my students, not all of, Le Guin uh, reaches them as easily as some other authors from this era. Right now, it's interesting. I find students come and go with Le Guin. Right now, they're not super into her, but they love the day before the revolution. So they're like, wow, that one just set me on fire. So Is it in a, yeah. uh, one of her collections, do you know? I, you know, I, let's find out right now. I, I'm not sure. It's a good question. Where did I even get it from? Mm-hmm. I think all the Hainish stories have been like the Library of America, I think, has a two volume thing that includes all the novels okay. and stories. Oh, if, if Le Guin published it, the Library of America is reprinting it. I promise yeah. you that. <laughs> um, I do think so she actually, kept oh, the, the okay. stories that were too closely tied to the novels out of the big um, retrospective Guys, collections that came out in the last decade. This is going to make Anthony happy. Um, uh, gentle listeners, you too can go read Ursula K. Le Guin's The Day Before the Revolution at the anarchistlibrary.org. Oh, so, nice. <laughs> <laughs> it is Excellent. free. Just go Google it online. <laughs> nice. All right, cool. So we're, uh, we're running a little bit up against time here, I guess. Um, you know, I'm going to go read The Left Hand of Darkness next. Mm. Um, so I guess, does anyone have any, uh, any advice for me going from this to the left hand of darkness? I feel like, I mean, I, it's been a, a few years since I've read it, so it's not super fresh in my mind, but I feel like it, it was definitely the characters were a lot more engaging. They were, they were, had more yes. agency, I guess. Um, and, and she goes a lot into the uh, sexuality of, of the cultures, the, the, the gender fluidity, basically. Yeah. And that, that comes into play in a, in a lot of her uh, stories uh, after that. So it's, that's really, I think, the first one where she did that. Uh, I, I love it. I mean, all I can say is, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think you're going to love the book. If you love The Dispossessed, you're going to love The Left Hand of Darkness. I feel like the left hand of darkness has the big ideas, but it also has the kind of personal narrative that I think a lot yeah. of us, and I get why we don't get the personal narrative in the dispossessed. I think there's a big intellectual exercise happening there, but um, it's more fun. Definitely. Like when they're out having the adventures, uh, exploring the world, her, her environmental sensibility comes through so clearly as uh, they're exploring that world. I think that that's really cool. I guess I'll also just mention some of the things I thought of while reading this. Some other works were um, the cartoon Eon Flux that we've really? done an episode oh, on. I did not get like, that at all. Wow. Because well, there's the wall and there's the two cities and one's the kind of libertarian city and one's the kind of authoritarian oh, city. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's see it now. Um, and then uh, Ian M. Banks' Use of Weapons, which okay. has kind of a similar structure, actually, to this, too. Oh, right. Um, wow. I didn't think of that, but you're right. Hmm. So I, I was wondering if there was any influence there, but it's also the kind of, you know, sort of communist utopian kind of society. Um, and then Kashu Ishiguro's novel, Let, Never Let Me Go, um, sort of expands on some of those themes of, you know, the power of social pressure and expectation and people's inability to transcend it. Um, so if you enjoyed those, I would recommend this. And if you enjoyed this, I would recommend those. So... Um, and we did, and I, we did an episode with Matt, um, on Eon Flux. So you check that out. Yes. That was fun. That was cool. <laughs> and the, the culture series by Ian M. Banks of which use of weapons is one is one of my all time favorite series in science fiction. And so, uh, 
And I could definitely, I was def, I don't know if anyone knows if there was any influence, but it certainly seems like I could, I could definitely see, see this having influenced that. Yeah, it's it a whole, politically it's a whole like related, but like aesthetically, they're very, very different, I guess. And they're also very big books. That's a whole, you know, a whole other panel you could do on just, um, you know, galactic societies in science fiction. Did you, have you done a, a, a podcast on that, Dave, on galactic societies in SF? I don't think we have. So maybe we maybe you should do that. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be a lot of reading, right? <laughs> I mean, you reading gotta... and movie viewing and game playing yeah. and, 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 <laughs> but it'd be cool. Yeah. 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 You might have to break that one up. Yeah. Okay, guys. So we're going to, here's the plan next week. We're going to do the whole, we're going to read the whole culture series and the whole Hanish cycle. And, and, and nice. Asimov's foundation. And... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. Let's, uh, well, let's, let's put that on the calendar. Um, so yeah, so we're pretty much out of time. So, uh, why don't we get just some final thoughts in here? So final thoughts on this whole experience of reading the dispossessed. So, uh, Lisa, final thoughts. The dispossessed is a book that is worth returning to again and again and again. And whether you love it or, or don't love it the first time through, I, there's always going to be enough there that's going to draw you back. And it's cool how it's going to reflect different things to you at different points in your life. So read it and read it again. Uh, Matt, final thoughts. Uh, yeah, what, what Lisa said, um, it's it's a book that, um, you know, like I said, I read 20 years ago and I got one thing out of it. I read it again and I got a different thing out of it. Both times I loved it. Um, it's a powerful book. It sits with me. I have a book. I have a, a bookshelf of my favorite books and it, it sits there and it's like it, it's just something that I like to just look at and think about from time to time. If you haven't read it, absolutely uh read it it's it's a it's definitely a journey and anthony final thoughts yeah i mean just to echo what everyone else said i think it's it's a great book and that it's it's also i think for anyone interested in political fiction it's just such a great example of how you can write uh, a novel where all the drama comes from the political ideas and that you can have a clear point of view, but like what's really so great about it is that there's so much debate and so many different points of view. And, and it does feel like, I feel like I have a good sense of where she stands on a lot of these, or Gwen stands on a lot of these issues, but so many other points of view are given uh, a fair hearing as well. And I think that's, that's something that writers aspire to, but so rarely achieve. Yeah. And, and again, I just thought it was, I thought it was amazing. I thought it was a work of incredible ambition and incredible, incredible accomplishment. And um, I mean, it is like, I won't say that it's not boring in places. I mean, but I think that if you like reading, a, you know, if, if you're not turned off by the idea of reading a book about that mostly consists of somebody thinking interesting thoughts or thinking about big ideas uh, while sitting in a chair, uh, <laughs> you know, this is about as, well done as, uh, as you could imagine, uh, that sort of story being done. Um, so yeah, I give it a huge recommendation. I'm sorry. I ignored my teachers. I apologize to all of you <laughs> and, uh, yeah, looking forward to reading left hand of darkness. Um, but yeah, so let's uh, wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Anthony Ha, Matthew Kressel and Lisa Yazik. So thanks everyone so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks Dave. Thank you. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Anthony Ha, Matthew Kressel, and Lisa Yazik for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoyed the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.